jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us like a hurricane I am a tree Thank you for tuning in and joining us on our Tuesday night midweek live stream service at Hope Church Midway. Hope you're doing well um, and we're praying for you. So we're just going to join together in worship tonight. This is a night where we can just set it aside and, and worship and pray and dig into God's word together. So let's go for it.
It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. There's a table that you've prepared for me. In the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. And surely, your goodness.
surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. lay down our burdens at your feet. I thank you that there's this real invitation to do that. We can just lay it all before you. And it's worship to do that. It's worship to surrender. It's worship to let go of the worries and to agree with what you say is true. To agree with you, God, because you're the truth. We want to agree with your love today with a fuller picture of what your love is.
spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so
Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for that love that you showed on the cross. You can just say the words, I love you. God, but you came out, you rescued us. You came to earth, God, to, to allow us to have the experience, to have a relationship with you. God, we are so grateful for what you've done. God, of reaching out to every single one of us. God, it says that you left the 99 to be with the one, God. It doesn't matter who we are, where we come from, what our background is, God. Your love is there for every single one of us, and we are so incredibly grateful. God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you so much for what it continues to mean in our lives. God, I pray that you would speak to us. God, allow us to share that same love that you have with others as well. God, put that heart into ours. Thank you so much for all you're doing. In Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. Well, thank you so much, worship team, and we thank you, everyone, who is gathered with us today. It's a great thing to see when we just take a step back and realize God's love and to think about his love for us and his love for others. You know, I, I always love seeing people's reaction when I get to tell them what Jesus says we need to do in order to follow him, because he makes it so easy. Jesus just said you need to love God and love others. If you do those two things, everything else is taken care of. And for a lot of people who grow up with a lot of uh, traditions and a lot of uh, different rules and regulations that they thought that they had to have um, before, when they start to hear about this freedom that is found in these two things, of loving God and loving others, they're so excited because they're saying, wow, this is great. I don't have to do all this other stuff that these people have piled up on top. I can focus on what Jesus says. But you know what? Even just loving God and loving others is not necessarily the easiest thing for us to do because sometimes we miss the fact that loving God and loving others is a rule. It is a commandment that Jesus says. He says, if we're wanting to fulfill everything in the Bible, this is the commandment to love God and to love others. It's a commandment that's given to us that if we want to live to see our purpose and the change that God wants to see in our world, we must do these two things. So it's not a question of if we should. This is what we're made for. But that doesn't mean that it's easy for us to do. What do we mean by this? Well, loving God doesn't seem to be the easiest thing at all times. Loving God when he doesn't seem to make sense or he doesn't do things that we would regard as good in our own personal perspective. Sometimes we have a hard time to do that. And loving others, well, others are, are human. They're flawed. They think differently. They're, they're different than us. And so we're going to look at these, this uh, great commandment that God gives us to love God and love others in a two-part series, um, this Tuesday and the next Tuesday, loving God and loving others and what that means. And today we're going to be looking at loving others, what we're going to start with. Now, if you've driven it all, you've had a hard time loving others at times. If you've had a coworker. If you've had a family member, if you've had a friend, um, basically if you've ever interacted with another human being in general, you've found it hard to love others at different times. It has been hard. In fact, if you've ever been on social media, sometimes you find it hard um, to love others. But actually, I think social media allows us to do something that most of us want to do in the first place with other people, either unfriend or unfollow someone that isn't like us. I think it's very easy. We, we just kind of wish we could do that in regular life that we didn't have to hear everything, all the rest of the noise. I think a lot of times that can make us want to do that. Ones who don't think like us, who don't vote like us, who have the same convictions, who don't have the same outlook in life. We want to just create this echo chamber in our world in general that we can kind of sometimes make online. A lot of times we want to make that in our regular world as well, this echo chamber around us. Because it's hard to follow the command to love others when we don't know how they feel. That's the problem of creating an echo chamber. If you're only around people that think like you, act like you, vote like you, talk like you, and all this other kind of experiences that you've had, well, then you don't know other people. You're only basically loving yourself. It's not loving others. As I'm loving myself because you think like I do, therefore I'm loving myself by loving you. That's not loving others. We're missing it if we're missing how other people feel and their experiences and who they are. By shutting them up and not wanting to hear what they're having to say, again, we're just loving ourselves. So we need to go beyond this. We have to get to know other people if we're wanting to love them. We have to get to know their story, get to know who they are as an individual, and allow God to move from there. 
Now, this is not an easy thing at any age, not in our age of technology, not in the ages of Jesus, not in biblical ages. It's not been easy. In fact, think about what Jesus says right before he's about to ascend to heaven. If you look at this, his last command, Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And right after Jesus says this, the disciples get filled with the Holy Spirit and they start reaching out to the Israelites and they're saying, we want to reach out to every single Israelite that's all throughout the rest of the earth. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said to tell people, not just people who are like you, but to tell everyone, to get involved with everyone. That's specifically what Jesus said. People everywhere. Not just the Jewish people everywhere, but everyone. You see, a lot of times they had a hard time because Gentiles were different. They grew up with a totally different set of values. They grew up with a totally different viewpoint on the world. They grew up with different uh, religious points of view. They grew up very, very different. And so it was hard for them to reach out to somebody who wasn't like them. It was very, very difficult. And so to say, well, we have to try to reach out to somebody who isn't anywhere like us uh, um, in far as any of their worldview, religious views, or any, even how they live or even grew up, and now we're supposed to reach out to them. We don't know how to do that. And so we see that they weren't doing this at the very beginning, even though this is Jesus' last command. And that command helps us to love God, love others, to do everything that the Bible tells us to do in order to follow the will of God. So we see this is the issue. And that brings us to today's passage when everything changes in the early church. We're going to look at Acts chapter 10 today, specifically, and we're going to start in verse 1. It says this. It says, In Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, and as was everyone in his household, he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Now, you might say, hold up, hold up, hold up. All right, so this guy was was a Roman officer. He was a Roman officer. Now, if you've done any kind of research, you've been around church at all, when they've talked about the Romans in this time, you know that everybody talks about the Romans as the oppressors. They were the people who had conquered all these lands, and they had taken everybody and said, okay, now you're going to follow our rules, our ways, and you're going to do what we tell you to do, or you're going to face the consequences that we'll put upon you. And so the Romans were not looked great by the Jewish people because they had conquered their land and told them what to do. And so now we have a Roman officer, army officer, that God's going to be speaking to. I think it's pretty exciting to think about, well, what is God going to say to him? Is God going to set him straight? Is God going to tell him what he thinks he should do? I mean, is God going to tell him, I want you to change your viewpoint? Uh, You're going to change your thinking? Is this what God's going to tell him to do? Well, let's see this, if God sets him straight or not. Verse 3 says, One afternoon about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming towards him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. Now, this has to seem shocking if you're thinking about God's now speaking to a Roman officer who has all these other views that are totally opposite of everyone else in Jerusalem, you know, that weren't in power. And you're saying, and he's not mentioning this power structure? He's not mentioning this time? What's going on? Well, because their political views were different. They were in different points of view. I mean, how did Cornelius see this? Maybe he saw Rome taking over as a way of helping out to keep law and order because everybody was going crazy. It wasn't until Rome built the roads that you saw people actually being able to travel safely throughout the known world at that point, not the western part of the world. And it wasn't until they were able to help out to put out a common language that people would be able to explain and to work better together and have education flow. Now, obviously, that's his part of point of view where everybody else saw, hey, you're killing our people and telling us to follow you. Two very different points of view. Very, very different points of view. Couldn't be more separate at all. But God's not saying, I'm attacking your politics. He says, I'm looking at your heart. I'm looking at your heart. And you're a God-fearing man. You're helping out other people. You're helping out people that are feeling oppressed. They're not feeling oppressed by you. No, you're helping them out. You're guiding them. You're working in their community. You're working and helping them out in real ways. And God notices this. This man loved God and he loved others. He was living his purpose. And God uses people with different perspectives. This is something we need to know. He will use different people who think differently than us. You know, I, for one, am happy that we have a church that's filled with people with different political views and social views and different perspectives in general. I'm glad we don't have an echo chamber. 
If we had an echo chamber, there would be a problem because that does not reflect society. But having different people with different perspectives is good because God will work in them to reach out to other people that others can't relate to, that others can't speak into their lives, they can't speak into their hearts. See, people have had different experiences and different influences in their lives that helps them to think in different ways. And that's okay as long as we're listening to God above everything. As long as we're listening to his word and saying, God, help me to guide, help that to be my main guide. That's what I want. And see, this is exactly what this army officer was doing. He's saying, okay, I know what Rome has told me. I've seen what's happened within the citizens around me. And God, what are you wanting me to do? What are you wanting me to do? How can I work in my job and yet still help out people in a real godly way? How can I do that? Where can I find this? And I see anybody looking from the outside would just put them out as, okay, you are just an officer of Rome, and this is how we're painting you, and this is just how we're going to see you. Anybody could have seen that, but that's not how God saw him. God saw his heart and saw his care for the people in the community and how he reached out to the people in the community. And he's saying, I'm caring about this, and I want to do something great in your life. This is important. So he's told to get Simon Peter. He's told to get Simon Peter. You see, God also has to prepare Peter. Not only is he preparing Cornelius and saying, okay, I want you to get ready and I'm going to speak something to you, but now God has to prepare Peter because Peter, again, sees the Roman officers in a certain way and how he was raised and how he was brought up and what his experience was. He sees them in a certain way and he's saying, okay, this is all my point of view. This is how I'm seeing it. And God's saying, I have to help to shift his lens, shift how he's thinking, allow him to see something in a new way, in a new lens. And so he gives Peter this vision. Verse 11. Peter, he saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. And the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. And then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Now, Peter has this vision three different times. So he's trying to figure out what's going on, what's happening with all that he's hearing this. Verse 19 says, Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So what's going on? Why does God give him this vision and then tell him to go with these men? Well, they were Gentiles. They were Gentiles. They were seen as as unclean. You weren't even supposed to go into their home. They were seen as that unclean. They're saying, well, this this is them. See, they were people that were othered. We We don't talk with those kinds of people. We talk with our own. And that's how it was seen. And so Peter was raised in this and saying, well, this is them and this is us. And they keep with themselves. We keep with ourselves. And that's how it's supposed to be. That's how society looked back then. That's not how Jesus wanted the society to be. That's why he gave his last command before he left to tell people everywhere. And also the overall commandment of loving God and loving others. That the people wouldn't feel othered, but know that we were loving everyone the same. And so Peter wasn't seeing this. Peter had to learn about this because he was going to be walking around and going with Gentiles. And Peter is not used to being around Gentiles. I mean, what are the other leaders going to say once he's around them? What are they going to say? What are they going to do? What is going to be their viewpoint when they hear that Peter talks to them? Well, this is what happens when he gets there. Verse 24. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I am a human being just like you. I think this phrase probably surprised even Peter. I wonder if he thought about the phrase as it was leaving his lips. I am a human being just like you like you. It wasn't just don't worship me because I'm flesh and blood. No, I think God was speaking to him and the Holy Spirit was speaking through him. I am a human being just like you. I'm not to treat you as impure. I'm not to treat you as an other. I need to see I'm a human being just like you. There is a similarity that God has. You are not an other. No, you are my brother in Christ. This is where things can shift. This is where things can change. We all need to have this point of view. 
It's very easy for us to say that no one is better than another, regardless of job, ethnicity, race, or background. This isn't some new statement, some great statement, something big that we're shouting out here, but this is something that people need to see and say, we are all human beings like each other. We have different uh, backgrounds, we have different culture, we have different points of view. That's great. And that's not a bad thing. God likes a mix in his house. He likes a mix in his family. That's a great thing. But we have to see that people are human beings just like us. See, a lot of times what happens is people start to treat people differently. And they start treating them differently for many reasons. They might think, well, I'm more enlightened than that person. I'm more educated than that person. I've seen more in my life than that person. And they automatically other someone. And that could be based on anything from their background. It could be based on their job. It could be based on their education level. It could be based on their race. And automatically they're othering someone because they feel, well, I haven't had this issue in my life. Therefore, it's not a problem. And we can easily feel this way. And you might feel, well, that's true that, you know, I've, I'm more, I've had more in my life than they have. And you might think that that's true, which is absolutely crazy to kind of think about. Then you might have that thought process. But does that mean that's any more, that your worth is any greater than anybody else's? No. So this is what Peter sees. Peter sees this as he's entering this man's house and this man is going down on the ground and trying to worship him and trying to praise him and saying, wow, man of God is coming to my house. People are coming to my house. He knew how big it was for someone, uh, for a Jewish person to come into his house. And when he was being looked at as someone who was unclean, he knew what a big deal that was. But for Peter, he was like, I'm just following what God told me to do. I'm just following what he told me to do. I mean, you can read it, and as we read on, you'll see he was still very kind of uh, wondering what was going on and still kind of playing a little bit close to the chest here, close to the vest. But, you know, the important thing for Peter is that he actually listened to what God was saying, was able to make a statement that I don't think he could have made before he had that vision, which I am a human being just like you. I don't think he would have made that until Jesus showed him this great vision and opened his eyes. It's important. You see, we always need to see someone else's worth. God was using this Roman soldier, this person that was being used by the state, that was being used in their area to try to hold down and to hold on to power. He was using this person that people looked at and looked at as just a horrible figure. And then he had somebody else that people looked at as just being low class. And, oh, he's just a fisherman, and he's uneducated, and he came from Galilee, and he has a weird accent, and all these other kinds of stuff that people would look at back in those days. And both people would be pushed down on um, social economically. People would be looking down on them socially for different reasons. But God uses both of them to do something amazing, to show the bring together of everyone underneath Jesus. We need to see everyone through God's eyes. See, the moment that we do that, everything changes. If we just look at people and just say, well, I'm going to see them for this, this, and this, and what I think that they can do, we're going to miss it. And we need to see everyone and say, I'm a human being just like them. You know, this reminds me of the, the modern Pentecostal movement. So the modern Pentecostal movement was started in the early 1900s. It was started by a man by the name of William J. Seymour, who was the son of former slaves. In fact, he wanted to go to Bible college, and he had this professor who really believed in what this man could do and was really championing him, but because of the Jim Crow laws, he couldn't go into the Bible college with everyone else, so he sat outside the window of the Bible college and was taking notes and listening as the teacher was teaching because he couldn't go inside the school. And then he goes to California and goes into a church and, and says, I believe that God is doing some great things, and we've been holding on so much on tradition and not just looking at what the Word of God has to say. Because the word of God says that this power is available for us today. And two days later, after preaching that in his first church, that church put a padlock on the door so he wouldn't be able to enter into the building. He was staying with another couple, and they said, well, we believe in what God is saying for you, and, and we believe what God has shared in here, and we can see the scriptures for ourselves. You're not just coming up with anything. You're looking at what the scriptures have to say. You're not looking at all these traditions that all these other people put on. They have all these great PhDs, and they sound really good on their names, and they have all this education. You're looking and seeing what does the scripture have to say. That's what you're doing. Let the Bible speak for itself. And because he did that, they had a great prayer meeting, and people were filled with the Spirit in powerful ways. 
In fact, they had to move to a whole other area because people kept on coming to the house and they couldn't feel it. And people were coming out into the, into the backyard and into the front yard just to hear them preach and hearing them share and to see what God was doing. And then they come into this big warehouse and people are meeting and the LA Times is there and all these other newspapers are there and they're so amazed. Why? Because it's not just an African-American pastor preaching with African-American people. No, it's a mixed race of people and they're all hearing what God has to say and they're all excited about what God is doing and they're uplifted by what the Bible has to say. They're not caring about this man's education. They're not caring about his background. They're not caring about the color of his skin. They're caring about what God is saying. You see, there's a difference. When we look at everyone through God's eyes, we're not going to be judging people. We're not going to be having all these preconceived notions. We're going to say, no, who is this person through God? This is who I want to see. I want to see someone who's following what the word of God has to say. And until this point, Peter was loving God, but he wasn't loving others fully. It's not until he sees Cornelius, Cornelius through Jesus' eyes, and you're a human being just like I am. It wasn't until he saw that that everything shifted and he was fully able to love others as God had called him to do. What are some people that we need to do that with? What are some others, some people that we've othered that we need to look at them and say, I, I know that we come from different areas, we come from different backgrounds, different political views, different social views, different, different uh, storylines in our lives, but how can we come together? Because God wants the beauty in mixing it all up. We're all different parts of the body the Bible talks about. We all have different stories. We have different parts, and God makes it different for a reason. He sees the beauty in the unity in our diversity. It's such an awesome thing. So we see that God uses a man who many people would have thought much of at that time. He would have been othered at that time to do great things. And now Peter is here, and he's standing in front of Cornelius, somebody who other people have othered. And what does he say? What does he do. Peter, verse 28 says, uh, says, Peter told them, you know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. I mean, this is amazing what this shows here. God doesn't want us treating people as others, but to love in totality saying, I'm not caring about what your thought process is. There is no othering in the kingdom of God. You can't do that with anybody, regardless of their political views, regardless of their race, regardless of their background, regardless of their culture. You can't other anyone. You have to love people in totality. You might not agree with someone's views. You might not agree with their viewpoint, but you still need to love them because their value to you and to the kingdom is huge. Why? Because they're your family. They're your family. And Peter gets to see this, but... God. God helped to change Peter's views. It helped to change him to thinking in a new way, something that was totally different, totally counterculture than everything that was around him. But God changed it all. I believe that God can still do amazing things once we say, I want to see as he sees and treat people as he treats others. This doesn't mean that we're going to agree with every political, social, or cultural matter, but we will love like Jesus. That we will do. I mean, think of the song we sang just before I came up. Jesus left the 99 to go after the one. That one obviously was going the other way, going the other direction because he was feeling, I don't want to go with the rest of the pack. I'm not going with the rest of the pack. I have my own personal view, my own thoughts, and everything else like that. Jesus didn't say, well, you know, hey, that's fine. We got these 99 here. We're going to take care of his, and this is going to be our nice little echo chamber. No, he goes after everyone. He goes after everyone. We have to have that same kind of love. If we're following Jesus and he lives in our heart, then he's going to affect our heart and we will love people in a different way just as we see this change with Peter, the shift that happens with Peter. This is the same type of shift that needs to happen in our lives so we can love everyone. Because Peter has learned to love, he preaches and everyone in that household is filled with the Holy Spirit and gets baptized and it's a beautiful sight. It's a sign of the church coming together fully. Everything that Jesus was talking about in Acts 1.8, when he says, hey, I want you to reach out to everyone, that's the first time Peter fully sees it in reality. Why? Because he was loving others. He stepped out of his comfort zone and reached out to somebody new, to reach out to someone different. But then we see that Peter comes back. And there's some people that aren't too happy that he went there, that he went to the other's house. And so they're starting to grill them. They're starting to say, well, you know what our rules are. You know what we're supposed to do. You know what our tradition is. You're not supposed to associate with those people. You're not supposed to do that. So Peter has this 
conversation with them. So what does he do? Does he make a bunch of excuses? Does he say, well, you know what? Uh, God gave me this vision, and so this is why I did. You know, is he trying to say all these things? No. He just shares to them what happens. He gives them the good news and shares what God is doing in their lives and saying, isn't it awesome what he's doing in their lives? And this is now my brother. This is now your brother. This is not another. This is our family. There's a difference now. He says this, chapter 11, verse 18. When the others hear this, heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sin and receiving eternal life. They could see the difference because somebody stepped out to get to know an other. Because someone stepped out and God guided them and they didn't say all the other excuses they could have made. They said, no, I want to see this person. I'm going to meet with this person. I'm going to hear this person's story. I'm going to hear this person's heart. Because of this, it changed everyone's view. It started to change their society. And that started moving on and on and on. And we saw the whole church shift after this moment. Everything changed when people actually started to love others. So what does this mean for you and I today? Well, the Bible tells us in my favorite verse that we need to love like God. And God loves us how? He says, why we were still sinners. Why we were still sinners. Christ said, I'm going to give my life for you. In other words, why we were still not having the same point of view of God, why we were going against him, when we weren't wanting to have anything to do with him, God said, I still love you enough to give my life for you. And nowadays, if someone doesn't agree with us, we unfriend them, we unfollow them, we try not to talk to them, we avoid them when we're at work, we try to have all these opposite views because I don't just want to get into it. And I think that that's an excuse we make a lot of times. I just don't want to get into it instead of, I need to get into it. I need to get into their story. Because if I don't know their story, how can I love a person? If I don't know who a person is, how can I truly care? If I don't sit down, if I don't spend the time to get to know them, just like Peter, I'm going to go to Cornelius' house. I'm going to talk to the man. I'm going to see his heart. And I'm going to be just like God saying, I am so amazed by who you are. And that's what Peter did. He's so amazed by seeing Cornelius once he met him and hearing his story. May God do the same with us. In this society that seems just more and more blocked out by whatever your views are on race, by whatever your views are on pol- politics, by whatever your views are on society, by whatever your views are on culture, we are pushing everybody into all these boxes until we can only get the people who are going to say the things that we want to say. That's not loving others. That's making others. You're not a part of our group. You're now them. That's the last thing that God has called us to do. He's called us to love others to get to know them, and to see a difference. So what does this mean for us practically? Well, we need to take someone who's seen as an other and realize that could be my brother or my sister in Christ. This is what this person can be. This could be my family. And yeah, they're going to be thinking differently, and yeah, they might have a different view, but I want to get to know who they are. So the first thing we need to do is just to hear their story. Hear their story. Sit down with them. Talk to them. Get to see what makes them tick. Then pray for them. Pray for them constantly. Say, God, I want to love this person. And and I don't know why I have this animosity towards them. I know they're rubbing me the wrong way. But God, I want to love them because, God, you called me. You commanded me to love others. So, God, help me to pray that I can help. That doesn't mean the relationship's going to be perfect. But, God, help me to love them. They might not love me back. But, God, let me um, put amazing amounts of love on them. And then work beside them the best you can. That family member, do some great things with them. Try to plan something with them. That coworker, try to plan to have some different times where you're hanging out together. We need to actually make steps, not just say in our heads, this is something I'm going to do. We actually need to make practical steps. I know none of this is easy. Loving others never is. Again, these two things, love God, love others, sound so simple. But they're some of the hardest things that we have to do. But isn't it great that we don't have to do it on our own? And we have Jesus living inside us, saying, I'm going to share my love in and through you. And you're going to see others as I see them, as family. Sisters and brothers, you just don't know fully yet. 
and I want you to see the love that's there and to care for them. Because you know what? I would leave everything to reach out to that one person. And God is calling us to leave everything, all of our echo chamber, and reach out to that person. And God's going to put that person on your heart. Why? Because I'm going to pray for you right now that God would do that. This will help to open your eyes and open your heart and allow you to see people in new ways, to see people as God sees them. Let us pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you have such a diverse family in your church. God, have people with different points of view, God, different backgrounds. God, we are so grateful in the diversity that's there. God, I pray that we won't just be seeking echo chambers, but God, we'll be seeking stories, God. You'll help us to, to reach out, to get to know other people. We want to have your kind of love. Not just wait until other people are doing the things that we want them to do or saying the things that we want them to say or any of those other things, but God, people that are actually seen as you're human just as I am. That revelation. God, that we'll have that same kind of a view, and I want to get to know this person. God, you put this person in my life for a reason, this family member, this friend, this coworker, this neighbor. You put this person in my life for a reason. God, how can I love them? God, allow us to hear their stories, to sit down and have those conversations. God, I pray that you'll allow us to, to really pray to love this person more and more, that we would see them with your eyes. God, because that changes everything. God, I pray that we'll see reconciliation just as we saw with this army officer and with this person who throughout their entire life was being oppressed. God, I pray that we'd see reconciliation that only comes from you. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing. We know your love. We know your heart. We are so grateful that we get to have in our lives. Thank you as you're walking in this journey with us, sharing us your love. Work in and through us in mighty ways. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We want to thank you for gathering with us together today. And I want to just give a couple of quick things. First of all, if you have a prayer request, please let us know. HopeChurchMidway at gmail.com. We want to pray with you. Maybe uh, you're going to tell us a story this next week and say, God put this person on my heart. And you know what? I, I want to pray for this person. I've had so much issues with this person at work or in my family or something like that. And I just need people to pray with me because I want to love everyone. We want to help to pray with you. We believe in the power of prayer. So please email us, HopeChurchMidway at gmail.com. Uh, if you're wanting to give, we thank you so much for those who have given so faithfully during this time. It, it's honestly uh, blown my mind how wonderfully generous you are and, and that giving spirit that you have. But if you'd like to give, so feel free. You can just Google Hope Church Midway and just go down to the bottom of the page, find the giving tab, go on the very bottom where it says Hope Midway Offerings. Check onto that, and uh, we'll make, that'll make sure that we uh, get that at this campus. You can also mail in um, any of your gifts uh, to 6059 South Archer Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60638. Feel free to do that. And then one last announcement before we leave today. We're really excited to be able to partner uh, in uh, the Harvey Food Distribution. Uh, we are changing the time zone. This is very important for everyone to know. We're changing the times to 4 p.m. instead of 10 a.m. So the volunteers will actually be there at 3 so don't come at four. That's when we're going to start everything. The volunteers actually meet there at three. We had to change everything because of a very unfortunate death that happened. And there will be a funeral, and we'll be explaining a little bit more of that next week. Um, but we really want you just to pray for our wonderful church, Bethel Gospel Tabernacle. They are dealing with the loss, actually, of their senior pastor and who passed away this last Sunday. And they're going to be having the funeral on Friday morning. But John's heart has always been outreach. It's who he was. And, you know, we, they know exactly what he would want to do. And so they're still continuing to do this. They're just doing it in the afternoon, having the funeral in the morning. So please keep them in prayer. They're a wonderful church, and they need our prayers right now. So please keep them in prayer. And again, all volunteers, 3 p.m., and then we'll be having the food distribution at 4. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you on Sunday at 10 a.m. Is that too bright for you? Cool. He readjusted the lights, so I'm good. But I, do you mind standing here real fast? I won't say it's too bright for you there. I'm fine with it.